Welcome uh, to Capital Inc. Um, my name is Randy Givens. I'm the head of Maritime Equity Research at Jefferies. Um, on today's panel, we have six of the top executives and one of the most exciting and in worldwide um, industries, and that's dry bulk shipping. So on the panel today, we have, let's see here, Jan Dieleman from President of Cargill, John Wobensmith, CEO of Jenko Shipping, uh, Paul Sajianu, CEO of Safe Balkers, Robert Bugby, President of Scorpio Balkers, Stamatis Antanis, CEO of Synergy Maritime Holdings, and Hamish Norton, President of Starbuck Carriers. If you can go ahead, uh, okay, here we go. There's the list. All right, so uh, with all the heavy hitters we have on stage, I want to treat this kind of like a boxing match. And I know all the, the positive outlook, everyone's going to be on the winning side. Uh, nevertheless, I'll be the referee. Um, so gentlemen, I want a good, clean panel. And although jabs will be allowed, no low blows. And we're going to keep the rounds pretty short and sweet. Um, so if you go on for multiple minutes about a question, <coughs> Robert, um, I'm going to have to ring the bell on you. So uh, with that, uh, let's get ready to rumble. Now, I know not everyone in here is a dry bulk expert, although you will be in an hour. Um, we can clearly see that the dry bulk shipping market is very tight. Obviously, rates went from 10,000 a day to over 30,000 a day and back to 10 just in the last seven months. And the Cape side sector was similar, but obviously smaller moves in the Panamax side. So um, other than kind of normal seasonality, uh, what has caused this spike into December and the subsequent fall? So Jan, I'll, I'll let you start on that one. Oh, thanks for that, Randy. No, I, in, indeed, what you say, there's a big seasonality uh, into that, but um, I think it got magnified last year. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, I think there was a big push from the miners on the iron ore side. Um, second of all, we, um, we had a very, very strong coal market. Uh, China was pulling a lot of coal. Um, but I think what really gave the accelerator was that what we call there was a little bit of a dislocation of the fleet, which basically means that a lot of the additional demand came in in the North Atlantic, and the fleet just happened to be in the South and in the Pacific. And that means you just need to get higher to solve it, and I think that created the spike. Um, if you look at the, the first quarter, um, seasonality for sure, um, but I also think the coal has been a little bit less steamy as it, uh, as it was before, and we have some delays in the grain season, so I think that's the explanation of the, uh, of the big move quarter on quarter. Great. Makes sense. Now, currently, as you can see here, one-year time charters are about 40 percent higher compared to this time last year, and three-year time charters are about 30 percent. So a few of you are on opposite ends of the spectrum here. Um, Paul is over at Safe Balkers. You have about 50% of your days covered, uh, whereas John and Robert here are about basically 0% uh, kind of full spot exposure. Um, so with that, just kind of wanted to get some thoughts around your, your strategy. Paul, if you can start kind of with contracts going forward. A lot of them are expiring here in 2018. Kind of what is your strategy and thinking uh, behind contracts versus spot? And then flipping it over to Robert and John, if you want to kind of give the the upside and, and why you prefer kind of the full spot exposure. So starting with Polis on the time charter side. Yes, uh, the, the decision about uh, long and short is not really in our hands. Uh, I don't think that uh, there are profitable charters for three or five years out in the market. Uh, so the decision we take is uh, we stay spot. And if, we if we find a good uh, number around uh, 10, 20 percent higher than the spot rate, the current spot rate, for six or 12 months, we go for six or 12 months. That's that's a policy. You know, if we can fix ships at 15, 16 thousand dollars a day for 12 months, we will do it. I consider it good cover, and uh, uh, we keep half of the ship spot and the other half at a profitable rate. If you go for two or three years, which I don't think there is a lot of appetite uh, yet. Uh, the rate drops, so why to go and uh, leave money on the table? We, are, we feel we are going into an ascending market. We are not prepared to leave money on the table against uh, long-term coverage. Cool. John, Robert, Spot. Uh, okay, but first of all, let's go back to your first slide because uh -oh. Uh -oh. no, you, don't, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Ultramax is actually uh, much higher today than they've been for years. We gave guidance at the end of the fourth quarter earnings that the first 50, 60 percent of the first quarter was fixed at a higher rate. And since then, the rate has just carried on going up every day. I think that that graph, I don't know what it refers okay. to, must be capes or something, capes right? Capes and Panamax. OK. There's more than capes and Panamaxes in shipping. You can't put every route on there. Okay. And uh, Ultramax is really hitting record rates all the time. This supports our view that 
in either event, we think the Cape size market's going up too. It's just a temporary lull. Across all of shipping, we think right cargo is going up. So we want to keep our fleet as spot as we can. And our low leverage and the new fleet allows us to do that. And you know, there may be a time for odd customers. We like customer relationships, but maybe we're willing to fix out a ship or two every now and again for a year. Right now, Ultramaxes are at $15,000 a day for one-year charters. That's pretty high. That's, that's okay. about it. I mean, <clears throat> I think we share the same view. Uh, we don't really see the reason uh, in 2018, at least right now, to put things away for long term. We'd much rather play the shorter term spot market. You know, we, we took some cover in the fourth quarter for the first quarter in anticipation of some seasonality, particularly on the, uh, on the Cape size sector. But having, uh, you know, an owner operator model with a lot of ships in the Atlantic coming into the grain season on the, on the ultras and supras, we think it's, it's the right move to, uh, to be spot. And as Robert said, on the Cape size side, Right now, a uh, little bit of a lull, mostly weather related out of Brazil. Australia is actually still uh, pushing ore out and shipping. Um, you know, we expect that to come back over the next few months, and uh, we certainly don't want to lock ourselves up uh, this year any long term. Now, having said that, you might get to the end of the year and, you know, Cape size rates, one year rates, three year rates, maybe $30,000 a day. And then you have to start and, and sit there and, and think about what you want your strategy for the next year or so off those rates. Sure, thanks. All right, so now focusing on some of the dry bulk shipping demand drivers. Uh, Stomatis, what is your outlook for iron ore capacity expansion and will the Brazilian, specifically Vale exports, um, be the main driver of dry bulk demand over the next two years? Yeah, hi Randy. Hey. Well, basically, we know for a fact that um, Vale is going to be expanding their exports by about 25 million tons a year. Uh, that by itself, uh, given the fact that uh, most of these exports are coming out of the Carajas area, which is the north uh, Brazilian side, that has a very strong uh, ton mile effect. We calculate that that particular expansion project alone, which is basically you know, an ongoing project, and uh, it has already started uh, to export uh, a big amount of cargo. That alone is going to be uh, requiring the incremental demand, the incremental uh, of about 40 additional cape sizes. Uh, the overall capaci capacity increase in 2018, we calculate that uh, is going to require an incremental am amount of about 60 capes, given the fact that the order book this year is only, I don't know, 10, 15 ships altogether to be delivered, if at all. Um, you know, having the demand for about 60 ships in our opinion, is going to create a very, very strong uh, supply squeeze, which is going to come into effect uh, in uh, Q2 and uh, later in the year. So we're very optimistic. Uh, right now, the spread for the higher grade iron ore, as you know, is uh, $20. The only place in the world that can provide the, such a high quality iron ore is uh, Brazil. And obviously, it cannot be better for shipping to have this additional high quality capacity coming out uh, from a longer distance, so we're very optimistic for that. Okay. Um, Hamish, speaking of iron ore, uh, what is your outlook for Chinese iron ore imports? As you can see here, uh, Chinese iron ore inventories are uh, pretty much at all-time highs. Does this worry you? Um, you know, it, it doesn't really worry me that the inventories are at all-time highs because, f first of all, uh, there's a long history of, of Chinese ore inventory tracking and there's been no statistical correlation between inventories and import levels. Um, basically, uh, Chinese uh, iron ore buyers and traders import more iron ore uh, when, when the price is in uh, contango and, and import less when it's in backwardation. Um, the other thing is you can, you can measure the inventories in terms of the size of the pile, but you only know what's on the outside of the pile. You don't know what's on the inside of the pile. Um, and just to, to make that maybe a bit clearer, uh, Chinese domestic iron ore um, averages less than 20% iron by weight, whereas Brazilian iron ore averages about 68% iron ore by uh, iron by weight, and Australian about 62. So Chinese domestic iron ore. Um, is a completely different animal from Brazilian or Australian. 
And, and so, you know, having a pile of iron ore, you know, in the port doesn't necessarily mean very much. Okay, that's fair. Polis, uh, how meaningful will Chinese and Indian coal imports be uh, to increase dry bulk shipping demand? So coal inventories, as you can see here, remain depleted, uh, but obviously China's kind of switching away from coal, doing some natural gas and, and shutting in some coal plants. And then India recently um, announced that they are going to allow private miners uh, to mine for the coal, obviously increasing domestic production, maybe decreasing import <coughs> demand. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on the coal trade? Yes, I think that uh, for the next decade at least coal will be an important, uh, important commodity for China. Uh, they have a huge uh, consumption, uh, maybe 3.5 billion tons. They import only a very small fraction of that as they seek uh, cleaner uh, fuel and uh, better quality of uh, air. They will increase their uh, Im imports of better quality. And uh, of course, there will be the ups and downs according to the season and according to the, uh, to the stockpiles they have there. But uh, I am optimistic in the long run. I don't know what will happen after 30 years, but in the next 10 years, I see that coal will be a very important commodity both for India and China. Also, I think a positive uh, uh, development is, is the fact that Indonesian exports are reducing. Uh, they use uh, more and more of their production for domestic purposes. So this will add to ton miles. So overall, I, I think it will be pleasantly surprised the next 10 years with the, with the coal uh, commo uh, trading going uh, higher. Okay. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, I, you know, I, um, I think the coal story is a little different from, from the iron ore. I think it's pretty easy to get your head around, um, you know, 4% growth on ton miles in, in the iron ore side for 2018 and 2019. I think coal is a little more difficult. Um, coal, I think, is a little more of a black box when it comes to Chinese policy. I mean, you literally can wake up one morning and next thing you know, the Chinese have said, okay, no coal imports for the next two months. Um, Having said that, where I'm optimistic is that is actually on the Indian side right now. Um, I think even with um, private companies mining coal, there are still major infrastructure problems on the rail side. And I actually think what you're going to start seeing, because you're, you're seeing port development go on and on in, uh, in India more so, and I actually think you're going to see more of a coastal trade that develops on the coal side. Um, because the rail system is so inefficient. And that, that's where I see, at least for the next three years, some positive um, growth on the coal side. China, I, you know, I kind of look at it as more flat to slightly up, okay. just because of that black box. Um, but I, but I, am, uh, I am pretty optimistic on, on India for the next three years. All right, Robert, obviously most of the focus has been kind of iron ore and coal. Looking at the grain trade, obviously we've seen an average of, I think, 7% over the last six years. Um, is this sustainable? Uh, most probably, yeah. I mean, the, the country's populations are still growing, and those populations are changing their dietary requirements. And the Chinese, fortunately, love their Big Macs as well as the U.S. president, right? Sure. Good, yeah. Unless well, it puts a tariff on it, it'll be fine. We're getting to that. So no, I, I think in general demand is there, but with crops in, uh, around the world, the world's getting used to big crops, and we didn't have any issue for the last three, four years. So you just never know. Supply so shop. I think sure. it's something you just need to keep in mind. Okay. Robert jumped to some tariffs there. So, um, Jan, we'll go back to you. U.S. steel and aluminum uh, import tariffs have been in the news recently. Um, how would that impact dry bulk shipping, how would that impact dry bulk shipping markets? I think overall the impact is probably pretty marginal at the moment. Um, I think there will be impacts more regionally. Um, you could see a little bit tighter U.S. Gulf because of less, bound, uh, less inbound cargoes over there. Um, but we're closely watching it because if they start spreading into other commodities, then um, there could be some more impacts. It for sure will um, create volatility. Anybody else? I, I was just going to say. You know, there's been a lot in the news on this, right? But let's face it, and I, I don't know what's going to happen when the market opens in 30 minutes, but the stocks actually, the dry bulk stocks have been going up through this whole period of all this fake news on, on steel tariffs um, on CNN and, and Bloomberg. So I think that's pretty indicative of, of what the reality is. 
Okay. I think it's very comforting as a shipping executive also to know that if you really screw up in shipping, you can become Commerce Secretary of the United States, right? <laughs> Where's Wilbur? Wilbur? He's not here. All right. <clears throat> well. That's what the rec- No comment there. All right. Switching gears to dry bulk shipping supply uh, and starting with your respective fleets. Uh, recent years, dry bulk companies have tended to focus on, on a certain um, kind of segment of the industry. Um, Synergy owns mostly Cape sizes, nine out of the 11 vessels. Safe Balkers owns mostly Panamaxes and Post Panas. Uh, Starbulk Genco, obviously, on the most diversified fleet with, I think, six to seven different classes. And Scorpio, the only one without any Cape sizes, focusing, smaller on the, on the, focusing on the smaller Cancer Maxes and Ultra Maxes. So, Starting with Stomatis, uh, what are the pros and cons to fleet specialization? And then over to John or, or Hamish, uh, what are the pros and cons to fleet diversification? Stomatis. Well, basically we like uh, that we, obviously, that we have bought our ships uh, in the last uh, two years that um, the Cape sizes hit uh, a 30-year low. So, you know, uh, being concentrated in one sector uh, by itself Sometimes it's a good idea, sometimes it's not. We like diversification as well, but you know, we think it's a great bonus for the company and our investors that we managed to get this kind of fleet concentration in the last uh, two years. So being in an industry with a higher volatility and uh, having taken out all the low side of the equation, I think there's only upside uh, for us and our investors. So we like that from an operational and commercial point of view. Uh, we are focusing on um, a smaller amount of charters but these are the higher quality of charters. These are the world's largest miners. And, um, you know, we're very happy with the name and the uh, re- reputation that we have established. So, so far, I think that this strategy has worked very good for the company. And um, in the future, I don't necessarily uh, rule out uh, diversifying the fleet, but for the time being, we're going to stay on the capes and uh, we're going to take advantage of the wave in the next uh, three, four years. Okay. And, uh, you know, there, there, there are um, some obvious advantages to, to diversification. Uh, you know, uh, obviously we won't do as well as the best performing vessel class in our fleet because um, that's, you know, only going to be one class at any given time. But this gives us a window into all of the various vessel classes, you know, we do our own technical and commercial management in-house. So, you know, it it helps to see the dynamics of what's going on with each of the vessel classes. And, you know, we may change over time the the concentration of of the fleet since since we're about a third capes and Newcastle maxes by number of ships. That's about half the value of the fleet in capes and Newcastle maxes. you know, and, and that could change over over time. Yeah, look, from a diversity standpoint, we like having a fleet that has direct exposure to every single dry bulk commodity. Um, we like the idea of being um, exposed on the iron ore front with the Cape size vessels. Granted, there is more volatility there, but with that volatility becomes uh, significant more upside, particularly with iron ore growth this year and next year. If you, look, if you look at our fleet overall, we have said publicly that, that we're going to be exiting the, uh, the Panamax sector, so we'll be more focused on our major bulk commercial operations and then our minor bulk, which are Ultramax down to our, to our handy size. We like that barbell approach. Again, the, the Ultramax and the minor bulk fleet provides a little more of a, of a steadier income stream, though Robert is correct that that class is, has been doing very well um, since really the middle of, of last year. Um, but it is a little more slow and steady, and then we like having that high beta exposure on the capes, and, uh, and we think our equity investors agree with that. Okay, a couple more quick questions on supply. So none of you have ordered um, new buildings recently, probably a good thing in this, in this market. Um, that said, there's still about 180 new building cape size plus uh, vessels on the order book at about 23 different shipyards. So how many of these shipyards are still taking orders, and when could you get a new building cape size or Camps or Max, uh, Robert, if, uh, if ordered today? I'll let you start. I've got the finest idea. <laughs> no idea, okay. 18 months, 24 no months. Idea. Anybody have a thought on that? 2020. 2020. All right. I think it depends how much you want to pay. Sure. Fair point. If you want to pay a lot, you can probably get one, you know, quicker. If you want to pay less, it'll take longer. Normal headline prices, two years. Okay, good. 
Good. Uh, during a uh, slight uh, charter rate recovery. Randy, if, I, if I may interrupt oh, on this it. one. A common misconception about the supply, especially on the Cape sizes, is that, you know, like um, Hemi said now, I mean, the more you pay, you know, the sooner you can get a ship. Well, this is not uh, so true for the Cape sizes. If someone was, uh, for example, totally crazy and he was sitting on, you know, $50 billion and he wanted to buy all the Cape size slots in the world, the maximum amount of ships that someone can contract from now until the second half of 2020 is 10 ships. You cannot possibly build more ships right now. Maybe 12, maybe 15, and that's a market that has been delivering 100 ships a year. So there is a very big cap on supply right now. So that's what makes us even more positive, because there is no shipyard capacity right now available to build additional cape sizes. Sure. Let's look at new bidding ordering. Um, obviously, during a, a charter rate recovery, um, ordering, ordering was pretty substantial in 2013 and 2014. Um, obviously, not much ordering 2015 and 16. But now, in the last 6 to 12 months, as you see on the right side of that chart, ordering has kind of picked up a little bit. So. Three quick questions. We'll start with Hamish. Uh, what is caused or allowed, I guess, for this recent ordering resurgence? Is financing that easily available? Uh, no, financing is not easily available, and that's partly what's caused the new building order resurgence. The best way to get leverage in dry bulk is to place an order with a shipyard with 5 or 10 percent down and uh, think you're going to flip that order before the next installment is due. Um, you know, you may not be able to get any financing at all except the yard financing in effect. Um, and you know, let's see what happens to some of these people <laughs> who've placed orders when the next installment becomes due at the yard. Sure. And I think that's led to a lot of slippage uh, recently. Second, um, order book to fleet ratio is still below 10 percent. Um, so what, if anything, is going to keep that from going 15, 20, 25 percent? John. Wow. I mean, as, as we recover in, into 2018, I think it's natural for, uh, for, for orders to be placed. I, I agree with Hamish. I still think there's some significant financing constraints, particularly even on the yard side, getting refund guarantees in place. Um, the European banks are finally starting to come back into the market, but they seem more focused on, on secondhand tonnage first. Um, there's a little bit of new building financing going on. But I, you know, I think it's part of the normal evolution. I, I guess what would really concern me is if we saw very large orders again with, with you know, by, backed by uh, private equity or, or hedge funds coming into the space. If I started to see that, I would, uh, I would be very concerned. And I think you also have to put it against the backdrop that 7% of the fleet is 20 years or older. So you're talking about 9.5% versus 7% that's probably going to go uh, to the scrapyards over the next three or four years. We've got regulations on the ballast water treatment side coming in uh, in 2019. We've got IMO 2020. There's a lot of catalysts to really force that 7% that of the fleet out. So right now, not, not concerned, but definitely keeping a uh, watchful eye on it. Yeah, and maybe we should have a show of hands. Of you institutional investors out there, how many of you would be prepared to take a uh, speculative dry bulk new building program to your investment committee? The next question would be, how many of you have bought into the, some of the, the latest Norwegian deals? That's a cross-check as to whether they're telling you the truth, uh -huh, right? Because they did get funded. Mm. Yeah. True. All right, um, one more question on this. New building orders are getting larger and larger in terms of uh, deadweight tonnage. So I think now the, the average or higher end is 208,000 deadweight tons or greater. So why is this, and do you see this trend continuing, Polis? Yes, uh, usually it is. The next uh, generation ship is uh, higher deadweight than the previous generation. Uh, in the case of Cape size, I think you are losing uh, versatility, you're losing optionalities by going to the Newcastle maxis from the Cape sizes. On the Kamsa maxis and the post Panamaxis, little better, uh, little uh, larger dead weight is always welcome. So this will continue as long as uh, uh, shipyards can provide the designs. Okay. Now looking at the opposite of, of fleet deliveries, scrapping has averaged about 25, 26 million deadweight tons over the last uh, six years or so, from 2011 to 2016 at least, uh, with 30 million deadweight tons scrapped in both 2015 and 16. Obviously 2017 they got cut in half to about 15 million deadweight tons. With that, and kind of what is the main driver of this and, and what do you expect scrapping to be in 2018 and 2019, higher or lower than I guess 2017? Robert, starting with you. No idea. Cool. Anyone else? 
Well, I mean, we're pretty optimistic about dry bulk rates for 2018 and 2019, and you know, the more optimistic one is about rates, the less optimistic one is about a lot of scrapping. Um, you know, inevitably, in a strong rate environment, people are going to try their hardest to keep a ship going. Okay. Speaking of fleet growth, uh, Jan, uh, at one point Cargill owned some dry bulk vessels, now charters in 600 to 650. Um, kind of what are your thoughts behind that? Would Cargill possibly look at owning vessels, and then how do you make that decision, I guess, owning versus time charter? Obviously, in recent years, it's been fully time charter. We. Um we look at both. We look at all sides. So we look at uh, paper markets. We look at time charter markets. We look at asset markets. Um, we do have opportunistic asset plays uh, in play, um, but we do think that owning ships, operating ships, is is a is a different business. And I think uh, a lot of the gentlemen on this table we we consider as being much better in doing that than we are. Uh, but opportunistically, we uh, we don't shy away from those opportunities. Okay. Uh, now looking at asset values, five-year and 10-year-old dry bulk vessels are about 35 to 40 percent below the 15-year average and still 20 percent below the 15-year average, excluding that 2006 to 2008 super cycle. Um, so Stamatis, uh, why do you think this is and what has the bigger impact on the asset values? Is it the one, three-year time charter rates or is it just shipyard capacity and, and discounts? Well, basically, as I mentioned before, there's a very limited uh, shipbuilding capacity uh, to build additional ships. So, you know, prices cannot get any longer. In many countries, um, like China, they have consolidated the shipbuilding uh, um, industry. In Korea, uh, some of the bigger yards that we used to know, the now under court receiverships uh, and all that, there's a big order book uh, for VLCCs and containers. So, the way it is, I mean, we have not. Uh, found the Cape Size project for anything less than 45 million in the last three, four months. Uh, given the spread uh, between, let's say, 33, 34 to 45, that does not actually make any sense for someone to go and uh, build a new building. Uh, another thing which is uh, very important to state for the audience is that, as you know, the Valamaxes, which you know, they're merely there to replace the existing VLOC order book, sorry, the VLOCs which are there to uh, replace um, the converted ones, um, some of these contracts uh, that they have already negotiated with Vale and they have all these contracts in place, the shipyards have increased the prices. So we're very confident that uh, a big amount of the Vale maxes of the VLOCs that uh, will be now on order will not make financial sense to be built. POSCO, for example, in uh, Korea and a number of other shipyards have increased the prices by about 10% uh, the last few months. So I'm not sure if all the VLOC orders that we see now will eventually materialize. Okay. You know, Randy, the one thing I would say on the second-hand values, you know, we've definitely seen a pretty significant run-up, particularly on the 15-year-old plus ships, which is very natural in a, uh, you know, in a, in a, in this part of the cycle that we're in. That we haven't seen some of the newer ships run uh, nearly as much. And I think that has to do with, with, again, lack of financing. So as financing starts to come back into this market, uh, latter part of this year, next year, I do think you will see a natural uh, lift on asset prices. In the meantime, you know, owners that have access to capital and, and can actually acquire newer ships, you know, I, th I think you're going to get some outsized return on capital here um, that, 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 you know, that can be taken advantage of. Okay. So all of you have relatively young average fleet ages. Um, Robert, two years, we were pointing that out. Uh, but there are some older vessels in most of your fleets. Um, Jenko, I know, recently decided to dispose of 15 of its older vessels. So at what age is a vessel too old to operate, either from an economic or a safety, a right ship rating uh, perspective? So Jan, I guess I'll, I'll let you answer that on the side of the chartering perspective. Is there a certain age cutoff? Yeah, there is. Uh, it depends a little bit per sector. I think it's a little bit too easy to just mention one name and of one number and that's it. Um, but there are specific grain trades on the smaller ships, which go up to 15, 20 years. Um, after that, it becomes a bit problematic. Um, but these ships are way less under stress than some of the bigger ones, like the Iron Ore. So we're stricter on the Iron Ore. Uh, we have a policy that we for sure don't fix anything over 18 years on the Iron Ore side. Um, but the reality is that um, we have a very young fleet. The average is seven and a half uh, years old, sure. which for uh, a substantial fleet in operation, I think is pretty young. 
Okay, now, now that rates are, are well above vessel OPEX levels, the, the cost side of the equation is a little less in focus. Um, that says some of you have reported much lower daily OPEX than others. So can you shed some light on the drivers between this uh, divergence in, in daily OPEX savings? Um, specifically, is the separation truly operating savings or just an, an accounting methodology? So what is included in your OPEX number? Uh, Hamish, I'll start with you since you have the lowest reported 4Q. 17. Yeah, I, I, look, I, I think OPEX is, uh, you know, reasonably consistent across most of the, the dry bulk public companies. You know, it's crew, um, uh, maintenance and spare parts, um, lubricants, insurance, um, you know, th those are the, uh, you know, the, major, the major factors. And, um, you know, our, our OPEX is low basically because we, we do the technical management of the fleet in-house and top management pays a lot of attention to the costs. And, um, you know, basically we have a large fleet and we squeeze our suppliers. Uh, you know, we're capable of giving a supplier a really big contract if they cut the price and uh, we beat up on them to cut the price. Stomatis, I see your OPEX is the highest. Um, obviously, that's with the, the largest uh, fleet, you know, obviously all, all cape sizes. Uh, Robert, do you want to talk a little bit about this? It looks like Starbucks is about $1,000 a day lower than Scorpio Balkers. Is that an apples to apples comparison? I have no idea. I spend little, <laughs> very little time looking at Starbucks. Um, <laughs> what is included in your OPEX? Same thing. I think that, well, we put a lot of stress on where we trade. So we do a lot of trading in the Atlantic and we come from the disciplines of tankers and we see that the dry bulk environmental compliance and safety compliances are accelerating. The customers are putting more of a stress on, you know, you don't yet have formal vettings like you do in tankers, but we'd imagine that's coming. So we have expenses there. Secondly, all of our crews are ITF because we want to be able to to do that, and that's a that's an expensive, you know, proposition. And thirdly, as we've explained on calls, we've just taken delivery of the fleet, and there's a cost involved at the beginning with storing up with lubes, etc. So you're going to continue, as you've seen each quarter, seeing our costs come down sure. anyway. And those are the three components, and we're very comfortable with with where we are on this. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, I, I should have mentioned that we have. Um, um, among, if not the highest, right ship rating of, of any of the, uh, the fleets, uh, you know, in the, in the public market. Sure. And they were happy to have him as members with so many ships. All right. Um, pros and cons uh, to chartering in-house versus using a, a pool. Um, John, uh, Jenko recently completed the withdrawal of 19 vessels from pools, integrating those into your in-house kind of commercial management. As such, I'll start with you kind of what the, the pros and cons of uh, in-house versus operating in a pool commercially. I, I, don't, I don't see any pros really of being in a third-party pool, uh, you know, at this point. You know, what, what we did at Genco was we pulled everything back from the pools. We, we took all of our ships, or we had a lot of our capes on index charter as well. And the concept there was that we didn't feel we were getting uh, the market intelligence um, that we wanted day to day. Um, and now that we're dealing directly with cargo owners, we have that uh, very deep market intelligence, which is very helpful to us both on the commercial side, but also making strategic decisions uh, within the company. Um, and we also wanted to increase our margins. When we're, when we're handing our ship over to an operator, most likely that operator is, is making money on it. And that was something that, uh, that we wanted to capture. So that has, um, has gone very well for us. We've already started to, uh, to see it pay off. And uh, we've, um, we've positioned our minor bulk fleet anyway quite a bit in the, uh, in the Atlantic. And so we've been earning premium rates. And, and the way to do that is dealing directly with, uh, with the cargo owners, which again has been, has been successful. Sure. All right, now turning now to IMO regulations. Uh, water ballast management requires, requirements were delayed until, I think, 2019. How is that going to impact the market? I know Scorpio Bulkers, all of your vessels are already fitted with the ballast water treatment systems. Uh, Polis, you've already agreed with Irma first to install these ballast water, ballast water treatment systems on Safe Bulkers fleet. So I'll let you answer that first. Yes, uh, we decided that uh, we cannot avoid this regulation. It was coming despite the extension that was given. 
I don't think Coast Guard, the U.S. Coast Guard, will give any extension. So we we decide to fit a, a U.S. Coast Guard compliant uh, system from a Greek company, which made us uh, uh, very happy to support the Greek the Greek uh, marine industry. Uh, I think that uh, there are many options for ship owners uh, on, on six or seven uh, treatment plants to fit the ballast water treatment early. I think th this will create commercial advantage. There are new buildings built in China that they are fitted with, uh, even in Japan, fitted with uh, systems that they are not approved yet. So that's a, that's a point that ship owners should be aware and should be carefully examining. So overall, I think uh, in this regulation, uh, owners have to move early. Now, regarding the IMO 2020 SOX regulation, uh, for the time being, we are examining it. Uh, I, I, we are not, uh, we are not uh, happy to take the burden of uh, scrubbers on our shoulders, simply because uh, liquidity in the in the company must be preserved for other purposes. We are happy to cooperate with the. Uh, charters uh, to pay part of it and uh, part to be paid by our charters, or we will wait for the industry to provide the compliant fuel, hopefully in the next six to 12 months, uh, and uh, burn this, uh, this new fuel. Our ships are mostly eco-type. Uh, the difference uh, could be afforded for a year or two until uh, we have more options. Good segue. Jan, I know you've been pretty vocal on this recently. Uh, IMO 2020, impacts on shipping. Thoughts? Well, I think it's big. Um, I think it's a game changer. I think it will um, create big differences between economical and, and non-economical ships. Um, I think it might accelerate some scrapping. Um, you might even slow down the fleet. So there's a lot of things that could happen there. I think for us, two things are, are very important. First of all is, uh, is enforcement. Uh, we will comply and we expect others to comply as well. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's a transition period, which is going to be um, pretty messy, I'm afraid. Uh, so it's going to be uh, very important that there's a, a clear transition period that comes out out of the IMO, so everybody can plan for it and uh, get on with it. Sure, Robert. So you had a hand up. I think it's worth listening to what that gentleman's just said because, you know, first of all, he's the customer. Second, we've just seen from the slide he has about twice as many ships as the rest of us put together on charter, that's quite big. And it is going to be a game changer, and it is going to be expensive for companies to comply with the water ballast, and it is going to be expensive for people to comply with the low sulfur regulations. And those are either going to be capex costs, which is obviously the newer ship you have, the longer you have to spread that capex cost over, and some of the, and if you don't do it properly, you might lose cargo. And also, if you ha already have fuel efficient ships, you're going to buy time in this position to see what really works in terms of the scrubbers, etc. So I wouldn't dismiss this. And we see from the product side, every day we're in contact with those refiners whose job it's going to be to provide all this. And so this is going to be, as this gentleman says, a game changer. So you should watch this and not just dismiss this in terms of it'll be capex to companies to comply on this as well as taking away from revenue at the same time. Okay, well, quickly on these last two. Uh, consolidation, you know, there's been plenty of discussion and action uh, in the tanker sector with consolidation recently. Obviously, the container um, segments, many big combinations there. So what is the outlook and potential, I guess, for dry bulk shipping consolidation? It's the most fragmented uh, with, I think, the top 10 owners only owning about 15% of the global fleet. Um, so Stomatis, any thoughts on consolidation? Well, uh, I don't think that the getting bigger necessarily means that uh, you're creating economies of scale. I mean, from a certain point um, of growth and onwards, <coughs> in my opinion, it brings in additional problems as compared to, um, you know, the saving $50 here and there. So what we have seen is that in the cape sizes, regardless if you have 10 capes like we do or you have 15 or 20, it doesn't put you in a position of strength towards the charter, so you're not going to be denominating the price yourself. I mean, okay, you may have a little operational leverage here and there, but we, uh, in synergy with only 10 ships, 
we overperformed the market by 6% last year uh, on the C3 and the C5. So we don't necessarily see that. On top of that, uh, when you're talking about consolidation, uh, you don't want to bring in someone else's problem. <laughs> For example, I mean, uh, in Synergy, we worked very hard to create one of the cleanest uh, balance sheets and corporate structures out there. So discussing of growing the company with a potential combination, uh, you know, it has to be a really good and clean story instead of bringing in high leverage or this kind of things or a restrictive covenants. We have none of those things and, uh, you know, why ruin it uh, when, uh, you know, you don't have to? Right, I want to save a few times for Q&A, so one more question. Um, if I, unfortunately not me, but, but an investor like this gentleman, uh, gave you $50 million in cash, what would you do with it? Buy secondhand vessels, pay down debt, share repurchases, something else. Um, so I'll let the owners begin, uh, starting with John, and then finish with Jan, if you have any specific asset class you'd, you'd focus on. So John, $50 million. So in terms of asset class in, in dry bulk, I, I, would, I would go buy capes today. I don't think those prices have, uh, have run up. They've been relatively flat. And uh, again, we're looking forward to a, a good second half this year and, and into next year. Uh, that's in dry bulk. Having said that, if somebody gave me $50 million personally right now, I might go buy tankers. Because just aware, you know, tankers are where the dry bulk industry was a year and a half ago, and now we've seen the recovery. But I'll just go, just going back to dry bulk and that Cape size for a second, I do think it's interesting because we've, we've now, you know, are in the beginning part of this recovery for dry bulk. Values still have not moved up very much in these newer asset classes, um, in Capes and Ultramaxes for that matter. So I do think because of the lack of financing, Owners that have access to capital are going to have these outsized return on capital numbers, um, at least for the next 12 months. Stamatis. Well, basically, uh, instead of uh, replying directly to the 50 million, um, I strongly believe that the Cape size is by far the best investment, both in dry bulk and in tankers, and I'll tell you why. A five-year-old Cape size today goes for about 33 million. That's, you know, 40% lower than the 15-year average, excluding the peak years. If the prices go up by half of that, so if, for example, you know, it goes up by three or four million altogether, and you charter the ship at 20,000, which is the prevailing charter rate, the return on investment on that particular thing is close to 40%. <laughs> so I don't really see you know, a better investment in shipping right now, personally. Hamish, pay down debt, share repurchases. Buy you know, I, I think if, if uh, we got 50 million to invest, um, I think the best investment right now in dry bulk is probably scrubbers. Awesome. Good answer. Keeping it short and simple. I think Go that for was it. a truthful answer, which is good. And water ballast systems. Um, I look, last time I was asked that question four or five months ago, I said that I thought that Torloff Troim was going to get lucky and he should buy gold at LNG. Sure. That's been pretty good. That's up 50%. Probably going to run another 20% in the next 30 days at least with the Scorpio announcement. Bonkers. So this time around, I'm going to go for Scorpio tankers. That's where I would put the money. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's bulk shipping. Sure. Product is bulk well, shipping. Listen, what would safe bulkers do with this money in terms of investing in safe bulkers? Uh, paying down debt, additional vessels. Don't tell me uh, some other shipping company. To be fair, to be fair, we've already bought back stock, both privately Correct. in Scorpio bulkers sure. and publicly, and it you doesn't seem to matter. So now I'm just telling everybody, don't worry about that. We'll be fine. Go ahead and for your own portfolios, keep with Gola LNG now. Buy stock. You're stink. taking my job now, but that's okay. okay. Go for it. So before Robert uh, replies for safe bulkers, uh, what I would say is, uh, I think the the most important to keep in mind that. The previous low we thought that we would ever, we would ever uh, have to face was the 2012 market, which was a 25-year-old. In our system now in the company, we inserted the new low of 2015-2016. So for us, it has to be the leveraging first and then uh, investment in uh, second-hand ships. So if you deleverage, uh, you have a strong company in the low market and then you can make a lot of money in the low market. It's no good 
to invest uh, further before you have a strong balance sheet because then you reach a bad market in three or four years' time and you have to dilute your shareholders, issue, make reverse splits and all the other uh, tricks that, uh, that you have to avoid uh, Chapter 11. So first deleveraging and then second hand ships. Jan, one word answer, sorry. Uh, segment that you would invest in right now, Cape Size, PNMX, Ultramax, uh, you pick it. Uh, I think if, you, if you're friendly to markets, which I think all of this, this on this table are, you'll have to go for capes. Uh, I would go for a delivery before 2020, and I would probably put a scrubber on. Thank you. Very good. All right, we'll have one minute for Q&A. If we have any questions from the audience, oh my goodness, whoever has a microphone, take it to someone. Here you go, starting here. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, sort of metrics that you guys look at relative to stock price for a second. We're talking a lot about the industry, you know, dams. With the uh, sort of sector lows being behind us, what are investors talking to you about? Is it earnings? Is it, a, a, you know, appraised value of ships? Is it, is it cash flow? Or is it just really a sector bet on rates and so forth? Go for it. I mean, investors don't really talk to us about what our share price should be worth. That's really what they talk to Randy about. Sure, yeah, and in this rate environment, people are starting to look at EV EBITDA multiples now that you're positive EBITDA. Um, price NAV is still the, the clear, I guess, favorite uh, in terms of valuation and apples to apples comparison against all these, these guys' fleet. One more question. Lambros Papa Econom Lloyd's List. Uh, when rates rise and when share prices rise, uh, there is also a high risk of uh, equity offerings uh, and dilution. Now, I understand that the equity offerings are, are never pre announced, but how would you answer a question by a pro prospective uh, investor in uh, your companies about dilution risk? If I, if I may say, in Synergy, we raised a smaller amount of money. We raised about 25 million in the last two years through third-party equity offerings. And the accretion that we have created from these offerings has been 110%. So for every dollar invested in our company, we managed to create an accretion of 110%. So the answer to the question is obviously, you know, what do you get for the equity offering? Even deleverage sometimes can be good, but at the end of the day, a new investor has to, you know, feel that it's creating some sort of a value. In our case, it created a huge value for our investors, and uh, I guess it's pretty much the same for everyone else. Sure. All right, we'll close it there. So obviously, the dry bulk market is extremely bullish at this point. Um, all the rising tide is going to lift all the boats. Uh, there's only going to be one real champion that wins the title belt to keep the boxing theme going. So if you want to know that, Randy Givens at Jeffries, I'll let you know.